This is how police finally tracked down a murderer who killed a girl on her way to school over 30 years ago. Gloria Pointer was a schoolgirl from Cleveland, Ohio. It was December 1984 and Gloria was just 14 at the time. Heartbreakingly, she was actually due to receive a perfect attendance award at school when she failed to reach her destination on the 6th of December. No one could have guessed the horrors that would unfold. She was discovered beaten and awed around two and a half hours after she began her journey to school. Tragically, due to the lack of technology at the time, her case quickly went cold. There was a serious lack of leads and any witnesses in the case, and no one was brought to justice for an agonising three decades. Finally, as time went on and technology advanced, there was a breakthrough. They were able to take a DNA sample from the clothing that Gloria was wearing at the time and identify the killer as Hernandez Warren. He was actually a convicted S offender. He was finally arrested for the murder in 2013 and he was found guilty of R and murder. He was given life in prison and will be eligible for parole in 2043. This depraved pedophile just couldn't stop committing crimes. This is 66-year-old Karamat Mansurabadi. So Karamat is from Wisconsin, and in 2023, February 2023 to be exact, reports came in that he had assaulted a child. Obviously, the police wanted to follow this up. They went to his home, they conducted an interview, and they felt like that was enough evidence to arrest Karamat. So he was arrested for the essay of a child, but he was then let out of jail. But something that investigators didn't know is that they had found even more evidence when they searched his property. You see, in February of 2023, when investigating the SA claim, they took Karamat's cell phone into evidence. But it was a few months later when they actually started going through the cell phone when they found some disturbing evidence. On Karamat's cell phone, they found over 30 CP or CSAM images that he had downloaded from the dark web. So he was then rearrested, brought back into custody, and his bail was then set at $1.8 million, ensuring that he wouldn't be able to leave jail until his trial. So the sentencing, the trial hasn't happened here yet, but I really hope that this guy gets put away for a very extended period of time. Chilling decades old murder remains unsolved to this day. Police in Melbourne are now offering a $1 million reward for help. It was the 17th of February, 1987. Marianne Fagan was 41 years old. She was living in Armadale in Australia and was a mother of five. On the day in question, Mary was last seen at 10.30 a.m. by a neighbour. She had driven her children to school shortly before. She'd also rang her husband at around 11 a.m. When school was finished for the day, her four eldest children made their way home and discovered their 17-month-old sibling home alone. The baby was crying and Mary's car was parked on the drive. The side gate to the house was open, but the doors were locked. Something was clearly wrong and the children decided to break into the house to see what was going on. They had the most horrific shock when they discovered their mother deceased. Shockingly, she was bound, gagged and fatally stabbed. Some personal items were taken from inside of the property that have still never been recovered to this day. Police were actually unable to determine from the crime scene and from the victim what the likely motive might have been. Chillingly, the case remains unsolved. This man dipped his own head into a deep fryer and this is a massive trigger warning. Okay, so at first glance, this looks like a normal chef just cooking in a kitchen. But what happens shortly after this is absolutely nightmare inducing. This chef tosses his own head into the deep fryer, completely deep frying his entire head with oil and dying. And the most messed up part about this is that there is a video of this. Apparently the man was possessed by some sort of ghost or demon, but I don't know how true that is. But the most believable reasoning for this is that he had some sort of mental illness, which was even noticed by some of his co-workers. But in the video, the man rotates his head extremely weirdly and inhumane, and then just throws his head into the deep fryer with no hesitation at all. Leading people to believe that he was possessed because why else would any sane person just throw their head into a deep fryer with oil? I don't recommend anybody watching or searching for the video because it is honestly pretty disturbing. Mainly because it just comes out of nowhere and you're not expecting it at all. One minute the chef is just cooking food doing his job and the next he starts twisting his head all weirdly and throws his head into the deep frying oil. I will never watch this video again and you should never. Imagine your dad crashing a car with you inside and then running away leaving you to die. Shelby Binney was a beautiful 16-year-old girl from Bixby. 
She was a well-loved high school student and cheerleader and on the 11th of January was inside a car with her dad behind the wheel. On the night in question, it's believed that her mum and dad were in the front of the car having a heated argument. Her dad is also believed to have been drinking that night. It's reported that her dad was driving at around 70 miles an hour and tried to overtake another car. This caused their SUV to flip over. Shockingly, Shelby was ejected from the car on impact. A passerby tried to run over to help and shockingly reportedly witnessed Shelby's dad run away from the scene. He's believed to have fled on foot, leaving his daughter there to die. A vodka bottle was later found in the crashed car. Now, obviously not having learnt his lesson from the original crash, it's believed that Elliot, Shelby's dad, actually ran to a family-owned business in the local area and got into another car. Police were able to track the car and hunt him down after 12 hours and he was behind the wheel. Elliot allegedly admitted to taking a gulp of the vodka that was found in the crashed vehicle. Concerningly, Elliot actually has a record of leaving accident scenes three previous times, but never served prison time for it. This has to be one of the most tragic incidents involving a child you will ever hear. On May 22nd, 2015, 25-year-old mother, Romisha Sims, took her three-year-old son, Jahir Dino Lee, to the park for some quality time. Once they got there, Romisha placed her son on one of the swings and began pushing him. All was good until Romisha started hearing voices around her and found herself in some sort of trance and was unable to lift Jair out of the swing. And when she snapped out of it, she found herself pushing her dead three-year-old son Jair on the swing with police officers surrounding her. It turns out Romisha was a schizophrenic and she forgot to take her medication. And she pushed her son Jair nearly 44 hours on the swing without stopping. Temperatures fell as low as 51 degrees and it was raining when she was pushing him, which caused Jair to die from dehydration and hypothermia. During her trial, the judge found Romisha not criminally responsible and sent her free under a five-year conditional release order, saying that she must see a psychiatrist and take her medication. This case is so sad, and can you imagine being this mother snapping out of that trance? She was probably so scared and confused and was wondering what happened to her little boy. Rest in peace to Jair, and this is just so unfortunate. This man was murdered by the most unlikely suspect. It was May 2017 in Bel Air, Ohio. Brad McGarry lay dead in his basement. Brad was a 43-year-old local gay man who worked in a coal mine. His friend, 30-year-old David McKinney, had raised the alarm when he had reportedly found Brad deceased. He was with his wife and daughter at the time. Now, Brad's death was obviously a huge shock to the local community. Who on earth would have had a motive to kill him? Clues actually lay at the crime scene. Brad's home appeared to be completely disheveled, as you would expect in a home invasion. However, unlike a normal burglary, nothing of great value was actually taken. Some expensive items lay completely undisturbed in the home. The crime scene appeared to be staged. Police started interviewing people who knew Brad and family and friends. They uncovered something very telling. Brad's cousin told authorities that Brad had actually been having an affair with a married man. The day he was killed, he was planning to meet a man named DJ. They'd been reportedly having an affair for years. It was then revealed that DJ's real name was David McKinney. When David was interrogated, he repeatedly changed his story. He finally confessed to the killing, but he stated it was self-defense. He was ultimately found guilty of murder and sentenced to a life in prison. Imagine being so afraid of your ex that you go to police for help multiple times. After they refuse to help you, he burns you alive. Just days before she was murdered, Kelly Wilkinson repeatedly cried out for help. She was a 27-year-old mother living in Brisbane. She was separated from her husband, former US Marine Brian Johnston. In early April 2021, he was actually charged with four serious counts of DV and was given watch house bail. In the next couple of weeks, Kelly was in serious distress. She actually tried to speak to police on numerous occasions, actually reportedly nearly every day, about her concerns. She told them she was scared for her life and scared for her children's life. She repeatedly told officers she just wasn't safe. Infuriatingly, they dismissed her claims as cop shopping. Kelly even reported to police that her ex had breached the conditions of his bail. She was turned away and told that there was nobody there who could deal with a DV issue. On the 20th of April, things would take a tragic turn. Having been completely let down by the people and systems that are supposed to protect her, 
Kelly was actually tied to a washing line by Brian and set on fire. Her burned body was discovered in her back garden at her home in Queensland. Brian was also found near the scene with burn injuries on him. Police recovered a petrol can, knives, rope and duct tape from the crime scene. He has pleaded guilty to her murder and will be sentenced in March. This woman is what nightmares are made of. She is nicknamed by history as the Black Widow, the Queen of Cocaine, the Godmother. I'm talking about Griselda Blanco. Raised in Colombia by a horrifically abusive mother, Griselda Blanco started a life of crime and prostitution at a very early age. After the death of her first husband, Griselda married a man named Alberto Bravo, and in the 70s, they moved to the bustling city of New York where they began a very successful narcotics trade, and she was designing lingerie to smuggle cocaine. These two were like the Bonnie and Clyde of cocaine. Griselda Blanco was not a woman you wanted to cross. She was a woman in the drug business, and she was notorious for her drive-by shootings on motorcycle. Matter of fact, it is said that she invented this method of killing. She was the woman behind the Dade County shopping mall massacre in 1979 where four people were slaughtered. She and her husband Alberto got into a dispute over drug money and she shot him and his six bodyguards. Horrifically, Griselda was not opposed to killing children or women either. Matter of fact, Griselda being a bisexual, she was often known to have parties of a certain kind with multiple women and after she got what she wanted out of those women, she would execute them for fun. She ultimately had to flee to California to avoid being assassinated. And in 2004, Griselda was actually deported back to Colombia where somebody ultimately got their revenge and she was killed in a motorcycle drive-by shooting. Y'all, I'm a recording artist trying to get a record deal. I tell these stories for fun. Please hit follow and like, and if you're one of my true fans, leave a comment and go check out my brand new EP called Revolver on Spotify, Apple Music, and Amazon. Bye. The mother of the Uvalde school shooter was arrested last year after making death threats herself. And this seems to be an alarming pattern of behavior in this family. So if you don't remember, in 2022, this man went into the Robb Elementary School in Uvalde, Texas and opened fire, killing 21 people altogether, 19 young children and two teachers. This was one of the most horrific events to ever really happen here in the United States. It sent shockwaves around the world. And those 21 students and teachers that lost their lives that day will never be forgotten. But in January of 2023, Salvador Ramos, the shooter's mother, Adriana Reyes, spent two nights in jail for threatening to murder her disabled partner that she lived with. Apparently, the man that she was dating stated that he felt terrified and felt like she could kill him at any second, and that's why he called the police to report her. Now, initially, she tried to claim that this never happened, but somebody who was a witness to these threats, who actually heard her screaming these death threats, corroborated the story with the police, and she was arrested. And if you'll remember, Salvador Ramos's cousin actually threatened to do the same thing as his cousin, aka he threatened to commit another shooting last year as well. And needless to say, I think that there's just something wrong here. This week on our podcast, my wife Courtney and I are starting our series about the Uvalde school shooting. Our podcast is called Murder in America, and we're going through everything that led up to this, the police failures, the massacre itself, and obviously everything that happened afterwards. This is by far the craziest video of 2024. This is a video that has gone viral in the past couple days in which a father or mother's boyfriend is threatening the son to shoot him, and he does. The video opens up with the father or boyfriend pointing the gun at the son. He can be heard saying, I'm going to blow his effing brains out right now. The mother then comes over and pulls the father away, screaming, no, no, stop. The father then walks away and the son then says, blow my brains out. The father then comes back into the room screaming, you want me to, while pointing the gun at him. The son flinches at this point and turns away and says, shoot me, I dare you. I guarantee you go to jail for life. The mother then shuts the door and you hear the father saying, I'm getting ready to blow his brains out and yours. I'm sick of this to the mother. The son then gets up and opens the door. He then says, you're going to blow my mom's brains out. The father then points the gun back at the son and fires. Everything goes silent as you hear the mom gasp. The camera then faces the floor and you hear the mom repeating, did he hit you? Did he hit you? And at this point, you see blood droplets hitting the floor. Once this happened, the mom screams, Oh my god, you're going to jail. The son then runs out of the house and shuts the door. The video then ends. Luckily, the bullet only grazed the son's ear and he survived, and the father or mother's boyfriend then went into the backyard and ended his own life. 
probably because he thought he killed his son with that shot. I don't know what caused this whole situation, but it had to be brewing for some time for the man to snap like this. You can find the video on Twitter, and it has over 25 million views in just a couple of days. The creepy guy. This story will terrify you. This coming in from Reddit user Kanuki. He says that he was about 14 at the time and walking back from school. Unfortunately for him though, he would have to walk through sketchy areas oftentimes to get home. He says that he was approaching an underpass or a subway when he saw this tall man. He could only describe him as very abnormally tall, white, and very skinny. He says that he was coming out of the underpass on the side of the path that was nearby. He then immediately crosses the road to the other side. He says that he lost focus of this guy and started looking at the floor and continued to walk towards the underpass. When all of a sudden, Kanuki got a terrible feeling. He said that he looked up and he saw this man sprinting full force directly towards him. The thing that freaked him out the most, though, was his face. He said that he looked so angry and just ready to attack. He says that he's never felt this feeling prior or after this incident, but he got a cold sweat instantly, as if his body knew this man was going to try to kill him. He says that he started sprinting to escape right away. He says that he was running probably for five minutes when he decided to stop and look back, and the man was gone. He says he's not sure why he did this, but he decided to call a friend of his and told him the whole story. He said that he described the man to his friend, and his friend knew exactly who he was. Apparently, he was a local crazy guy who's terrorized locals for years, in and out of prison for various things. Kanuki says that he's had nightmares of people sprinting towards him ever since. So what do you guys think you would have done in this situation? Let me know in the comments down below. This is by far one of the most sickening murders in American history. This is the Watts family, and in the early hours of August 13th, 2018, Christopher Lee Watts murdered his pregnant wife Shannon by strangulation, and right after this, he murdered his two young daughters, who are four and three, by smothering them with a pillow, all while they begged their dad not to kill them. He then buried Shannon in a shallow grave near an oil storage facility, and he then dumped his two children's dead bodies into an oil tank. Christopher Watts initially maintained his innocence in his family's disappearance, but was arrested on August 15th after confessing in an interview with detectives to murdering Shannon, and he then later admitted to murdering his children. He did this because he wanted to run away and start a new life with the girl he was cheating on his wife with, and he thought the solution to this was to kill his entire family. There's also this clip of him being interviewed by some news outlet, and in the video, he's begging for his wife and children to come back. Now at this point, nobody has any clue that he killed them, but he does. He remembers exactly what happened, he knows that they're dead, he knows how he killed them, and he's still on live TV begging them to come home, saying he can't live without them. Just watch this clip, it's absolutely sickening. My last question, if you have any of them, is a good phrase, something. My last question, if your wife can see this, Shannon, Bella, Celeste, if you're out there, just, just, just come back. Like, if somebody has her, just please bring her back. I need to see everybody. I need to see everybody again. This house is not complete with without anybody here. Please bring her back. That's it. I can take that mic off. This case has had my brain working overtime ever since it happened. It's still unsolved and I would love to know your theories. Carly Goose was reported missing by her family on the morning of October 13th, 2018. The night before she had been out partying with friends and when she returned home, she was acting really bizarrely. She was slurring her words, she was disorientated and she was acting that strangely that her parents actually recorded her in the hopes that they could show that to her the next morning to put her off doing drugs again. She admitted to smoking marijuana, but her dad, Zach, believed that it had been laced with something stronger. Only when they woke up, Carly was nowhere to be seen. She had completely vanished. They did stay up with her most of the night to make sure she was okay, but eventually they dozed off. And when they woke up, she was gone. 
witnesses did report seeing someone matching Carly's description in the early hours of the morning walking south away from her Mono County home. At the time of her disappearance, Carly was just 16 years old and four years later in 2022, this age progression picture was released showing what she might look like in the hopes that someone might come forwards and somebody actually did. In August 2023, investigators were investigating a lead from a recovering drug user saying that he'd seen Carly in 2021 at a party, two and a half years after she went missing. Unfortunately, nothing came of this lead. It's now over five years later and Carly's family still have absolutely no idea what happened to her. How can someone just leave the house in the middle of the night and vanish into thin air? They are not giving up hope though and they do hope that someone one day will come forward with some information. The former NYPD detective started working with a forensic biologist that decided to test if Todd was actually in the lake for three weeks like police say. Together they placed pig carcasses, which is reportedly very similar to human bodies in terms of decomposition, into a pond for three weeks dressed in clothing that resembled Todd's outfit. The carcasses collected aquatic insects within the first day, and by day three, the insects had laid eggs. By day 21, the carcasses completely collapsed from the insect activity, and the clothes were covered in that slimy green film from the water. This test proved that it's extremely unlikely that Todd's body was in the lake for those 22 days. So they gave all of this information to the Michigan State Police in hopes they would reopen and reinvestigate the case, but nothing has really come of it. Kevin Anthony and Michael believe Todd is a possible victim of the Smiley Face Killers. The Smiley Face Killer is a theory, emphasis on theory, of an alleged network of serial killers that targets college age men and dumps their bodies in nearby waterways. They then leave graffiti smiley faces at the death sites. This is controversial, but I figured I'd add this in because multiple people came forward and stated that they saw a smiley face spray painted onto a tree near where Todd's body was found. A card with a smiley face on it was also found on his grave. Todd's mom even believes that he could be a possible victim of the smiley face killers. But the Michigan State Police almost refused to look deeper into this case. They created a petition to reopen Todd's case with the permission of his mom, and it would mean the world to her if he would sign it and join the fight in getting Todd justice. The link is in my bio. South Yorkshire police are officially investigating the death of U.S. ice hockey player Adam Johnson, who horrifically died during a game on Saturday. Adam was an extremely talented hockey player who recently began playing for the Nottingham Panthers for the 2023-2024 season. On Saturday, the Panthers were playing against the Sheffield Steelers at the Utilita Arena in England. During the second period, Adam suffered a serious neck injury after colliding with Matt Petgrave, a Steelers player. Everyone in the arena witnessed the incident, and it was also caught on video, which I do not recommend watching out of respect for Adam's family. It's incredibly graphic, and I wish that I didn't see it. Adam briefly stood up, bleeding profusely out of his neck. He did manage to skate off the ice with the help of a teammate, but he ultimately collapsed again. His teammates tried to help him, but he was rushed to the hospital where doctors tried to get him through surgery, but they couldn't stop the bleeding, and he ultimately died. The arena was immediately evacuated, and the game was suspended after Adam was rushed to the hospital. The police have recently stated that although its officers have now left the scene, the investigation remains ongoing, and it will take time due to the complex nature of this tragic incident. They said that with any unexpected or sudden deaths, it's standard practice to fully investigate the circumstances and report their findings to the coroner. The English Ice Hockey Association has since stated that starting December 31st, net guards will become mandatory for player safety. In the meantime, they are strongly recommended, but they do understand that there will likely be some anticipated supply issues. There's been a major uproar on social media where many believe that Matt's kick was intentional, while many others, including a few of Adam's teammates, think that this was a horrific freak accident and they don't blame Matt for the incident. According to an international sports lawyer, from a theoretical standpoint, Matt could be prosecuted. But from a practical standpoint, it's not super likely, as officials would have to find sufficient evidence that the kick was intentional and that this was more than just a freak accident. But overall, Adam's family just wants this to be investigated properly. I mean, after all, we have seen this happen time and time again. I've attached a GoFundMe in my bio that's organized by the Nottingham Panthers Ice Hockey Club. All of the donations will go to supporting local charitable activities in Hibbing, Minnesota, which was Adam's hometown. Rest in peace, Adam Johnson. This little girl got revenge on her killer from beyond the grave. On the 25th of January 2005, Katie Coleman finished school and went back to her home in Indiana, United States. Katie was 10 years old and lived with her mum and dad and sister. 
At 3 p.m. that day, her mum asked her to go to the dollar store to get toilet roll. Now, Katie knew the area well, and it wasn't really far to go. After getting the toilet roll from the shop, Katie stopped at the bank to get a lollipop for her way home. However, when Katie's dad returned home, the little girl still wasn't back. Her parents called police and a few days later an Amber Alert was issued. A witness came forward to say that they'd seen a girl who looked like Katie in a truck. The driver was described as a skinny white man about six feet tall with short dark hair and fair complexion. Tragically, five days after going missing, Katie's body was found. It was in a creek just a few miles from her home. Disturbingly, her hands and feet were tied and she had been essayed. It was determined that her cause of death had been drowning. 20-year-old Charles Hickman rang the police to confess. He said he and another man had abducted Katie after she'd witnessed a substance deal. He said they tried to scare her into not saying anything and they tied her up, but she ended up falling in and drowning. Disgustingly, this turned out to be a false confession. This obviously wasted police time and caused massive amounts of distress to Katie's family. Police continued to look for evidence and they did find a cigarette butt near to Katie's body. They tested it for DNA and it matched a man called Anthony Stockelman. Police compared the DNA on the cigarette butt to the DNA on Katie's body and it was a match. Anthony, a father of two young boys, was in the area that day visiting his mother. He entered a guilty plea and was given life in prison without parole. But this is not the only punishment that Anthony would receive. Now, Anthony claims that he was under the influence of extreme mental or emotional disturbance during the crime. He said this is because his father had died six months prior. Regardless, Anthony was imprisoned. Unlucky for Anthony, he was actually housed in a prison with Katie's cousin. Jared Harris was serving a sentence for burglary and was in the same wing as Anthony. Jared forcibly tattooed the words Katie's revenge across Anthony's forehead. He wanted to brand Anthony for life for killing his young cousin. Some people are saying that this video is proof that a demon possessed this priest. Let me know in the comments what you think. Watch this. So let me know what you guys think. Do you think this priest was really possessed by a demon? Or is he just a piece of shit? This man is one of the worst pedophiles in the history of Texas. I'm going to warn you right now, this story is extremely graphic and disturbing, so viewer discretion is advised. So the Galleria Mall in Houston is one of the largest malls in America. It's actually only about 15 minutes from where my apartment is, and it's a very, very nice mall. But at a kiosk inside of the mall worked one of the worst monsters I've ever read about. This man, Arthur Fernandez. So on December 6, 2023, an Australian anti-child exploitation agency flagged a video that appeared from America. This video appeared to depict two toddlers being essayed by a group of at least seven men in a bathroom. These videos initially appeared on an invitation-only dark web forum for pedophiles. And one of the young boys who was victimized in the video was being abused on a changing table. Authorities were eventually able to track down the Galleria Mall in Houston as being the place where these sickening videos were recorded. Keep in mind there were four different videos depicting the abuse of these toddlers by this group of seven men. And eventually, because of two silver bracelets that Arthur was wearing on his wrists, he was identified. As it turned out, Arthur wears these bracelets all the time and the relatives of the two young victims identified Arthur through these bracelets. Apparently, Arthur worked with the mother of one of these children and worked next door to the mother of the other child. And sometimes when these two mothers were called into work on their days off, they would trust Arthur to keep care of their kids. The evidence in this case is overwhelming and disgusting. I'm going to read this to you. This is from the Daily Mail. One of the men even told the victim, the young child in the video, to shut the F up as he struggled. And in another video, an abuser called the boy, you effing slut, and told him to cry like a little itch. 
So, so far, none of the other men in this case have been charged with anything or even identified, and I think that they need to find these guys as soon as physically possible and bring them to justice, because this is horrific and disgusting that these men are still out there walking amongst us. And now I'm going to look at the Galleria here in Houston in a completely different light. And I hope that Arthur suffers for the rest of his hopefully short life. 21-year-old Lily James was found brutally murdered in her school's gym bathroom, and the person responsible was one of her scorned male colleagues. Lily was a water polo coach at St. Andrew's Cathedral School in Sydney, Australia. For the past five weeks before her death, Lily was dating 24-year-old Paul Fison, who was a cricket and hockey coach at the same school. But just days before, Lily had actually broken up with Paul and just wanted to remain friendly with her male colleague. But on October 25th, Lily was reported missing after failing to return home. Just before midnight, police were received a phone call from Paul stating that there was a body at the school that should be investigated. And when police arrived, they walked into a gruesome scene. There in the school's gym bathroom was a woman who had been a clear victim of homicide. Police described the woman as having serious head injuries from a hammer that left her to be unrecognizable. So much so that it took them until the next morning to officially identify her as Lily. Authorities began combing through surveillance footage and found that Lily was last seen alive on CCTV footage, entering the gym bathroom around 7 p.m. the night she was found. Paul was seen following her close behind and entering the bathroom as well. It's assumed that a fight broke out between the two of them, and that an hour later, Paul was seen leaving the bathroom without Lily. Sometime after the attack, Paul texted Lily's dad from her phone asking to be picked up from the school. He then went to Diamond Bay Reserve, which was his last known location, and dumped a backpack containing some personal belongings and a hammer, which was later determined to be the murder weapon. Around two hours later, this is when Paul called 911 to report the body at the school. After this, Paul disappeared, and this is when police publicly identified him as the prime suspect in Lily's death. His body would be found two days later on the rocks beneath Diamond Bay Reserve by a group of tradesmen. He was identified via fingerprints, and it was determined that he ended his own life after murdering Lily. There were no reported domestic violence issues between the two of them in the past, but that doesn't really mean anything because, as we all know, we never truly know what happens behind closed doors. Lily was described as the nicest and kindest person who was vibrant, outgoing, and very much loved by her family and friends. I've attached a GoFundMe in my bio created for Lily's family to take the time necessary to grieve this incredible loss. I'd like to end this video on a note from Lily's grandma. She said, quote, Some people come into this world, I think they are so special, and they don't stay long. I think that was my granddaughter, end quote. Sometimes true for stranger and fiction. The case of Richard Trenton Chase is a story which even the most depraved horror writer would struggle to create. Over the course of four weeks spanning across 1977 and 1978, Richard Chase took the lives of six innocent victims in Sacramento, California. His murders gradually progressed in violence, beginning with drive-by shootings and culminated in acts of cannibalism. On June 11, 2005, Todd Guybe seemingly vanished from an all-night keg party. But 22 days later, his body was found standing upright in a private lake that had already been previously searched. At around 9.30 that night, Todd and his friends left a restaurant to go to an all-night keg party that was being held in an apple orchard in Casnovia, Michigan. As the night went on, things started to get really rowdy, so Todd decided to leave the party at 12.45 a.m. and walk back to his apartment, which was only about a mile and a half away. Doing so, he called a friend to tell them that he was on his way back home. Over the next 10 minutes, Todd made a series of bizarre phone calls. At one point, he called a friend and said, quote, I'm in a field, end quote, before the call ended. The friend called back and Todd picked up, but all they could hear was what sounded like heavy breathing, and then the call cut out. No other calls went through after this, and his phone wasn't used again. This was the last time anyone heard from Todd. He was soon reported missing, and an extensive search was launched involving more than 1,500 volunteers and police officers. Authorities even searched by air, combing through the orchard and everything around it, even the stretch of road he would have taken to get home. Authorities brought in bloodhounds, which tracked Todd's scent up until the start of the road he would have taken to get home, but that's where it ends. It seemed as if Todd vanished into thin air. But 22 days later, his body was found in a private lake just two miles from his home, right in the middle of an area that had already been searched. But the odd thing was the way Todd's body was found. His body was found standing upright in the water with his head and shoulders above the surface. Nothing was weighing him down and he had no external injuries. 
His remains only had little decomposition. His clothing appeared to be completely clean of debris, sand, and that slimy green substance that lays on the surface of bodies of water. He also didn't have any insects in or on his body, which is unusual if somebody was actually in the water for 21 days. A group of former NYPD detectives named Kevin Gannon, Anthony Duarte, and Michael Donovan, and Todd's mom had an independent investigation conducted. And from that, they learned that while Todd had been missing for three weeks, he had actually only been dead for two to five days before being found. The autopsy report also showed no water in Todd's lungs at all. Kevin, Anthony, and Michael believed Todd was abducted, held on land for a period of time, murdered, and then placed in the water after death shortly before being found. Adding to this, on top of alcohol being found in his system, he also had traces of antidepressants, but he was never prescribed those. The pharmacist working on the case stated that those pills would normally never be given together because if they were, it would likely cause confusion and hallucinations. They agreed that both the pills and alcohol found in the system would have left him completely incapacitated and unable to get to the lake by himself. Despite all of this evidence, the Michigan State Police ultimately ruled Todd's cause of death as undetermined drowning. They believe Todd left the party intoxicated and just accidentally drowned in the lake. But Todd's mom and Kevin, Anthony, and Michael do not believe this. I'm sorry I have to do a part two, but that'll be posted in the comments right now. This is by far one of the worst ways somebody has ever died, and whatever you do, don't look up the picture. This is Asachi Auchi, and he became the most radioactive man in history after a lab accident. On September 30th, 1999, the 34-year-old Hisachi and two other co-workers were working at the Takamura nuclear plant in Takamura, Japan, and they were put on an extremely tight deadline by their superiors. The plant converted uranium hexafluoride into enriched uranium for the purposes of nuclear energy. This usually involved a carefully timed multi-step process, but Hasachi and his co-workers attempted to take a shortcut to meet their deadlines. But sadly, this turned into a horrific explosion of uranium solution that turned into a nightmare for Hasachi. The plant underwent emergency evacuation, and the three men were immediately rushed to help. They all had been directly exposed to harmful radiation, but to different degrees. The sole survivor of the group was exposed to three sieverts of radiation. The second one was exposed to 10 sieverts of radiation, and Hasachi was exposed to a whopping 17 sieverts of radiation which was way more than any other human in history. And by the time Hisachi arrived at the hospital, his body was already covered in burns, and his eyes were leaking blood, but his agony had just begun. Three days after the accident, Hisachi was transferred to the University of Tokyo Hospital. Hisachi's lack of white blood cells and his non-existent immune response prompted experts to try a number of procedures to save him. Doctors tried countless skin grafts and blood transfusions and even stem cell transplants, but sadly, none of these seemed to work. Hisachi soon cried out, I can't take it anymore, I'm not a guinea pig, just after one week of treatment, but although Hisachi begged for his death, his family insisted that doctors kept him alive to keep trying experimental treatments. Hisachi's skin began to melt off of his body and even after this, his relatives ordered his doctors to do whatever it took to keep him alive. All in all, Hisachi was kept alive against his will for a disturbing 83 days. And at one point, he suffered three heart attacks in just one hour. And following the guidelines from his family, the doctors resurrected him again and again and again. Every time he died, he came back and suffered extreme brain damage. And on December 21st, 1999, Hisachi finally died of his last heart attack after multi-organ failure and it was only then that his torture stopped. You really can't fathom the amount of pain this man was in until you see the photo of him. He doesn't even look human and kinda looks like an insect. The radiation poisoning is that bad. I don't recommend looking the photo up, but if you do, while you're looking at it, keep in mind he was kept alive for 83 days in this state. Could you honestly imagine what was going through his head and what his body was feeling? This is something straight out of a nightmare, and may Hisachi Auchi rest in peace. This girl got cut into 2,000 pieces, and this is a massive trigger warning. On January 19th, 1996, the mutilated remains of Diao Aikwing, who disappeared nine days prior, were found across multiple locations in China. Her body had been dismembered into over 2,000 pieces. The case remains unsolved, and it's one of the most notorious crimes in Chinese history. On January 10th, 1996 in the evening, Diao and her college roommate were punished for the illegal use of an electric appliance. 
After a conflict with the dormitory management, she left the building and did not return. Diao was last seen alive wearing a red coat with a black lining. She was reported missing, but her family was not notified by the authorities until January 19th. The discovery of Diao's remains in the winter of January 19th was first reported by a sanitary worker. Initially, he thought it was pork, so he brought it home for food. And while preparing the meat for himself, three human fingers were found in it. The worker then reported the discovery to the police and they confirmed they were human fingers. Human remains in plastic wrapped packages were eventually discovered across eight locations around the university, including at a stadium, entrance gate, hospital, and along roadsides. The police later confirmed that the scattered remains were of Diao's and informed her father to visit Neijing. Between January 20th and 30th, Diao's head and clothes were found. More than 2,000 human remains were recovered. Diao's head and internal organs were boiled for several days. Crucial organs including the heart, liver, and spleen were never found. The forensics team was only able to identify the remains as belonging to a female through the analysis of body hair and muscle tissue. Relatives of Diao were able to identify her through a mole on her right cheek. A senior officer involved in the case described the killing as really cruel, which in my opinion is a nice way to put it. The officer also added that the pieces of flesh were dissected with high precision, only achieved by an individual with great understanding of anatomy. Police concluded that the murderer must have been a professional butcher or surgeon. Teachers and students then became the subject of investigation. Two suspect profiles were brought up including a single, physical, fit, middle-aged male. However, the university department could not find any individuals that matched the characteristics of the profile. A major investigation was launched in the university and the areas around, but no major clues of the crime were found and the case failed to make any progress. In 2016, Nanjing police told the family of Diao that the case is still under investigation. Okay, so let's talk about this case for a second. If the killer was never found and he had the skill to dissect somebody into 2,000 pieces, and never get caught with it, don't you think he might be a serial killer? And if he was, how many more people do you think he murdered after Diao? The dedication and skill, and honestly the obsession to cut somebody into 2,000 pieces and not get caught with it is crazy. This person could be walking around the streets of China today doing the same things to other people that he did to Diao. The thought of that is absolutely disturbing and may Diao rest in peace. However, coined the phrase, you can't make this stuff up. I have known the story of real-life boogeyman, Albert Fish. A slight, elderly man with gray hair, no one suspected the kindly single father of being sadistic, child, murderer, and cannibal. I'm not trained in torture methods, which is what I'm gonna have to make do. I got my drill here. The reason why it's got this fucking padding on it is just to try to silence it a bit, because I'm in an apartment. Um, I got gags. That video was recorded on January 7th, 2005 by 29-year-old Ricky Rodriguez. And the next day, he would go on to kill a woman before taking his own life. Now, the story of Ricky Rodriguez is an incredibly sad and complex one. But his adoptive parents were members and leaders of a cult in America known as The Family. Basically, this cult believed that Ricky was a prophet that was going to bring about the end times. And this honestly was one of the worst cults in American history. You see, various members of the family, the cult, essayed Ricky from a very young age. There were nannies that assaulted him, parents that assaulted him, and dozens of members of the cult who were even photographed assaulting him. And members of this cult actually wrote down a record of all of these assaults, describing them in graphic detail and provided photographic evidence in a little book that they titled The Story of David Ito. This book, written by members of the cult, was a 762-page document documenting the essay and abuse of Ricky from a young age. Like I said, they even included photos of Ricky standing next to naked, fully grown adult women at orgies. Keep in mind, he was only a child through all of this, and he was forced to participate in all of these acts. So there's a lot more that goes into this story, but basically, as an adult, Ricky had been irreparably harmed from all this abuse he suffered as a child. And so, in January of 2005, he decided to take revenge against the people that had abused him when he was younger. This included his own adoptive parents and anybody really associated with the cult. 
So on January 8th, 2005, after an extended period of trying to track down members of the cult, at this time they were all living under pseudonyms, Ricky finally found one of the people who had abused him. Her name was Angela M. Smith, and she was a nanny when he was younger. A nanny that participated in these group orgies and disturbing acts with the children. So January 7th, Ricky records that video of him talking about how he's going to murder and torture someone. Then January 8th, he invites Angela over for dinner. And when she arrived, facing his abuser, he stabbed her multiple times in the arm and then slashed her throat. Ricky stated later on that while she was dying, Angela expressed the thought to him that she didn't know what she had did wrong. But Ricky then freaked out, he left his apartment, he drove to a nearby motel, started calling his friends and family, even called his wife, I forgot to mention Ricky was married at the time, but it was too late for anybody to save him. Ricky even pleaded for his wife to take her life with him, but she wouldn't. And later that night, Ricky ended his own life with the handgun he had brought. This whole thing opened up a massive investigation into the family. Luckily, a lot of these members are off of the streets now. But this is just a disturbing, sad story from beginning to end. And I'm going to play you a little more from that tape he recorded right now. It sucks. Got lots of fucking duct tape. Um, I got a soldering iron. Sheets. Got a crude implement. I think can work wonders, especially if it's used in the right way. This case has got me absolutely infuriated. This is Harmony Montgomery and she would have been turning 10 this year just like my oldest child. Only her life was cut short in 2019. And due to the actions of this absolute monster seen smirking here in court, her remains have never been found and it's very unlikely that they ever will be. Quick trigger warning, not only was her death horrific but what happened to her body after her death is absolutely sickening. Harmony was born on 7th of June 2014 to Mum Crystal, seen here, and Dad Adam, although Adam was actually in prison at the time of Harmony's birth. Harmony's mother actually lost custody of Harmony at just two months old due to her substance abuse. Harmony went to live with foster carers three times in total, returning back to her mother and then returning back to them. She was then joined at the foster carers by her little brother, Jameson, who Crystal had also lost custody of. They absolutely adored each other and Harmony was a really loving big sister. But in 2019, Harmony was given to her father, Adam. No proper home checks had been done and Adam had only seen Harmony a handful of times, yet he was awarded full custody. Harmony went to live with her dad, Adam, Adam's girlfriend, Kayla, and their two young sons. Crystal did have some contact, but she last saw Harmony on a FaceTime call around Easter 2019. In July, August and October that same year, there were visits to Adam and Kayla's house from the Department of Children, Youth and Families after an anonymous call saying that Harmony had been seen with facial bruising and a black eye. The marks were explained away by Adam, saying that Harmony had been struck in the face with a toy and no further action was taken. It wasn't until November 2021 that Crystal phoned the police and told them that she hadn't seen her daughter in over two years and they then decided to try and track down Adam and Kayla. They found them living in a car and Harmony was nowhere to be seen. A missing children's case was launched and an investigation began, but in August 2022, police revealed that it was no longer a missing child case and they believed that Harmony was dead and it turned into a homicide investigation. And in October 2022, Adam Montgomery was arrested and charged with second degree murder. The trial is ongoing and he is actually currently incarcerated for separate charges on firearms offences and he's serving up to 30 years in prison. Adam's estranged wife, Kayla, Harmony's stepmom, who's also serving an 18 month sentence for perjury, has testified in court and told everybody what Adam did with Harmony. In December, 2019, Kayla, Adam, Harmony and their two young sons were all living in a car after being evicted from their home. It was on the 7th of December, 2019 that Harmony was murdered. Kayla has revealed that Harmony had a toilet accident on the back seat of the car while they were driving and this absolutely infuriated Adam. Every time they would stop a red light, he would turn round and punch Harmony in the head and face. 
she said that they would often hide Harmony under a blanket on the back seat to hide the fact that she was bruised and battered. On this day, after several punches from Adam, Harmony was moaning on the back seat and she was covered with this blanket. She eventually fell silent and the couple say that they thought she was asleep. According to Kayla, they then went and bought some drugs and got some drive through food for their two young sons and themselves. Nothing for Harmony. It wasn't until two hours later when they pulled back that blanket that they realised that Harmony was dead. I honestly cannot wrap my head around what he did next with Harmony's body. It's absolutely sickening, so trigger warning here again. It's really difficult to listen to. Adam took a duffel bag from the back of the car. He took Harmony's body out of the car, folded her in half and stuffed her inside that duffel bag. The family then went to a shelter where Adam placed that bag into a snowbank where it stayed for a couple of days. He then took that bag into where they were staying and he placed the bag inside the ceiling in an air vent. He would take that bag to work with him every single day and place it inside a freezer on the bottom shelf. His colleagues have said that they saw the bag several times and had no idea what was inside it, even though Harmony was decomposing at the time. Every time he placed that bag into that ceiling, Harmony would start to thaw out and the room started to smell. This is when Adam did something that my head can't even wrap itself around. He took Harmony's body into the bathroom, placed her in the bath, and he then started to run hot water over her body. He would then push on, press on and squeeze Harmony's body to try and get rid of all the bodily fluids that were making the room smell. He then told Kayla that he needed to dismember Harmony's body in order to try and get rid of it. And he suggested using a handsaw and a Nutribullet blender to get rid of her remains. In February 2020, Adam allegedly bought some limestone, a metal cutting diamond blade, a lithium iron battery and a power grinder. He then rented a U-Haul truck and disappeared with that duffel bag. When he returned back to his family, the bag wasn't with him. He is the only person in this whole world that knows where Harmony's remains are, but he's denying murdering her, so he is very unlikely to ever give up that information. It's extremely unlikely that Harmony's remains will ever be found and it's just tragic that this beautiful five-year-old girl can never be laid to rest. Adam is facing charges of second degree murder and abuse of a corpse. The maximum sentence is life without parole and it will be served either concurrently or consecutively with his current sentence. There is so much testimony in this case. It's obviously an ongoing court case. And if you want to follow along with it, you can do on Court TV here on TikTok. That's where I've been following it. And that's where you will get all the information and you can watch everybody's witness testimony. Killer accidentally admitted to his crimes by accident when he forgot he was wearing a microphone while taking part in a documentary. This is how a true crime documentary exposed a killer. In 1971, Robert Durst met Kathleen McCormack and they got married. At the time of her disappearance in 1982, Kathleen had nearly graduated college. She was last seen by a witness at a dinner party where she appeared to be upset. She got a call from Robert and left. Robert admitted to having argued with Kathleen that night, but he said he put her on a train to New York and then never saw her again. Her friend called police to report her missing. Interestingly, Kathleen had been treated at a medical center for facial bruises weeks prior to this and told the friend that Robert had done it. Robert had actually been dating someone else for some time prior to this and had been living separately to Kathleen. When her family broke into her cottage to try and find out where she was, they found the place had been trashed and her possessions put in the bin. Kathleen's family always believed that Robert was involved in her disappearance. In 2000, Susan Berman, a friend of Robert's, was found murdered. Now, she'd actually provided Robert with an alibi for Kathleen's disappearance. Now, pay really close attention to this next bit. Days after she was killed, a letter addressed to the Beverly Hills Police Department contained Susan's address and the word cadaver on it. On the envelope, Beverly was misspelled. Robert admitted in 2005 that Susan had called him shortly before her death to say that the police wanted to question her about Kathleen going missing. It's believed that Robert killed Susan to keep her quiet. In 2001, Robert's neighbor's body parts were found floating in Galveston Bay. Robert's elderly neighbor, Morris Black, had been killed and Robert was arrested. 
He was actually released on bail and fled and was found about a month later in Pennsylvania. He was found with $37,000 cash, two weapons and interestingly Morris Black's driving license. In court, Robert claimed he was acting in self-defense. He said he'd accidentally shot Morris and dismembered his body. Due to lack of forensics, he only got five years in jail. This is where things get really crazy. HBO was filming a documentary called The Jinx. During production, Susan's stepson found a letter written by Robert. This contained the same spelling error in the word Beverly as the anonymous letter to police. This implicated Robert in the murder. Now, while filming the documentary, Robert needed the toilet. He forgot that he had a microphone still attached to him. He was recorded talking to himself. He said, there it is, you're caught. You're right, of course, but you can't imagine. Arrest him. And then he said, what a disaster. He was right, I was wrong. And finally, he said, I'm having difficulty with the question. What the hell did I do? Killed them all, of course. This pedophile was so terrible that when he was released from prison, they actually put out a public safety warning, warning people to stay away from this guy. This is James Alfred Cooper, who Canadian officials nicknamed the worst pedophile in Canadian history. So back in 1903, James was convicted of the brutal essays and torture of six children in Canada. And apparently he had used a number of torture devices to keep these kids from talking. He had used a cat o' nine tails, a cow whip, a cattle prod, belts and sticks. I mean, six victims, they all went through so much and this guy was responsible for all of it. James's background is shrouded in mystery. Nobody knows too much about what he went through as a kid, but he was convicted of assault when he was 22 years old back in 1958. And years later, his criminal career started out with burglary. So at first, when he would break into houses, he would just steal things for the thrill of it. He would take family photos. He would take fridge magnets, items from the kitchen. But that evolved into him wanting to wake up the people that he was robbing. He would stand over these people's beds, wake them up violently in the middle of the night, and then escape out of a window or through the door that he broke in through. But that evolved into a desire to S.A. people inside of their own homes. At one point, he S.A.'d a minor in their own home at knife point after waking them up in the middle of the night. He also did the same thing to a single mother while holding her at knife point. I mean, this guy was terrible and it would only get worse. At one point, though, he married a woman named Patricia, who already had three kids. He would eventually have another child with her. And this is when the abuse of children began. And this is when the abuse really started. He would use these horrific tools to actually torture and abuse the children that were living under his own roof. And he did these mind games with the kids. He even made them eat things like their own excrement out of their pants while everybody in the house watched. I mean, this guy was sick and twisted. I mean, there's so much to the story that is so graphic and disturbing that I cannot talk about it here on TikTok. If you want to look it up, there's a great article online that explains this whole case and it's it's just really hard to get through. But he would even do things like buy tubs of ice cream, rub it on his body and make his children lick it off of him. He even at one point invited a neighborhood girl over with one of his own children and he essayed both of them. Keep in mind this whole time he was also physically abusing the children, beating them, he was verbally abusing them. He was just the worst person. I can't even get that across how bad of a guy this dude was. Eventually though, in 1987, he finally was arrested and charged with doing all of these horrible things. Eventually DNA would link him to some of the break-ins that he had committed as well and the assaults that he had committed during those break-ins. And at the time he was given a 30 year sentence. Now that doesn't sound like very much, but in Canada, that was the longest sentence ever given in Canadian history for crimes like this. But unfortunately with Canada's laws, this meant that he didn't have to serve that much time for what he had done to his own children, to all of these kids for so many years, to all the random people he had uh, victimized during the break-ins. And in 2012, he was allowed to walk free from prison after only serving 21 years. He was paroled out. And that's what led the Toronto Police Department, like I said at the beginning, to release a public safety warning, warning people that this guy was out of prison, he was walking amongst them, and that they didn't know what he was going to do next. So at the end of the day, if his sentences would have been imposed consecutively instead of concurrently, he would have been in prison for 180 years, meaning he would have died in prison. But since they don't do that in Canada, he only ended up serving those 21 years. Now, there is a little silver lining. Shortly after his release, he was re-arrested for breaking the terms of his parole. And at the time, he was on chemical castration drugs. He was actually urging his doctor to give him less of them. 
But since he was a first-time offender, as they called him back in 93 when he was sentenced, he was released shortly after violating the terms of his parole, and once again, he is somewhere out in Canadian society doing God knows what. I just thought I should make this TikTok to let you guys know that he is out there, and he's dangerous. He is a terrible human being. I'm, I'm urging you, if you want to read more about this case, to look up the news article. It is one of the most disgusting things I've ever read, and... Yeah, this guy is really worst of the worst. I, I can't think of a worse individual than this guy. Family of this missing girl found out via the media that she'd been murdered, butchered and sold as kebab meat. This case will put you off ever eating a kebab again. Charlene Downs disappeared aged just 14 years old in November 2003. She was living in Blackpool, UK, and was last seen in an area containing many kebab shops and takeaways. While out with her friends one night, Charlene bumped into her mum. Her mum said that Charlene needed to be home by 10pm that night, which was quite typical for Charlene. Tragically, this would be the last time that her mum would ever see Charlene alive. When Charlene didn't turn up by 10pm, her dad went out on his bike looking for her for around half an hour. When he couldn't find her, he just presumed that she'd stayed over at her friend's house and went home and went to sleep. When she still didn't arrive the next morning, her parents started to get worried and they called police. Police, however, said that they could not report this as a missing person until she'd been missing for 48 hours. Eventually, police did start to look for her, but they said that they presumed she was a runaway. The case went cold until three years later. Charlene's family were called into a police station. There was news of two men who had been arrested linked with a local takeaway called Funny Boys. They were arrested on suspicion of murder and disposal of Charlene. This is when the family found out some shocking news via the media about what had happened to Charlene. An article published stated that she had been grinded up and sold as kebab meat. One of the brothers of the men who had been arrested had heard them bragging about doing this. Now, Charlene's disappearance actually unearthed the fact that these takeaways were being used as a front for pee rings, where men were luring teenagers in with food and alcohol in exchange for things I cannot repeat on this app. When the case against these two men went to trial, the jury failed to reach a verdict. The case was then thrown out of court due to apparent lack of physical evidence. One of the reasons for this is how well Charlene's body had obviously been disposed of. Both men who had been charged were given a quarter of a million pounds compensation for being falsely trialed. Around a week after the trial, Charlene's mum was actually arrested for stabbing her husband. He declined to press charges saying that he knew she had been stressed. Members of the family were also charged with racially aggravated assault against the brother of the man who'd been charged with murder and also punching the man who'd been charged with helping dispose of her body. In August 2017, police arrested a 51-year-old man who lived in Blackpool at the time of Charlene's disappearance. This was on suspicion of murdering her, however, he was released just two days later. We still have no justice for Charlene and nobody is behind bars for her killing.